سلام علیکم سلام علیکم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم All praises are Allah's Lord of the worlds May his peace and blessings be upon our master the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate Ahlul Bayt Tonight, inshallah, I'll try to fit it all in one session so we don't continue with this tomorrow. It's the last of the discussions on family issues. And I thought this theme of tonight is important. If one takes one's emails as an evaluator for problems in society, this is one issue which I do get quite a bit of email on. And it's in relation to the motto, the temporary marriage in Islam. And it's something which sometimes it's been misunderstood, sometimes it's been abused. And once it gets abused, then people blame Islam for different things. I think this is quite important to mention, just to share with you a few dimensions to this delicate theme. Now, there's a principle the Fuqaha have, it's a fatwa which they all give, and that's a, if you not marrying leads you to sin, you fear sinning if you don't marry, any kind of sin, then they say it's vajib to marry. But the thing is, they don't say it's a vajib to marry a permanent marriage. And that's where, that's the first misunderstanding we come across. So we get these youths who, if they don't marry, they will fall into sin, whatever the sin be. And they think now permanent marriage is the key. Although it's good to propagate permanent marriages amongst the youth. But we have to explain the rationale behind permanent marriages. So here then, Islam comes with two forms of marriages. One is holy in origin. The purpose behind the permanent marriage is to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a fundamental pivot to this kind of marriage. One is to relieve your animalistic tendencies, primarily. It doesn't have to be to get closer to Allah. That's not the aim. So when it says, if you fear not, you're not marrying, you sin, it's a vajib to marry, all the Pukha say this, it doesn't mean you have to enter the permanent marriage. Don't rush into permanent marriages. So what happens, we all rush into permanent marriages, and then you get the difficulties that arise, as you see yourselves, both in the East and the West, divorces and different things which arise in marriages. With permanent marriages, having taqwa, the partner having taqwa, is regarded primarily if the person is abandoning Salat, it's even makruh to marry them. If you fear you may lose your faith, it's haram to marry them. You have these in fiqh. See, because why? Because the whole aim of permanent marriages is for you to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But with temporary marriages, we see none of these exist. It's not important. It's not as important, rather. So we have to appreciate Islam has come with two different forms of marriages. If we limit it to either one, you're going to lead to the negative consequences will arise in society. We'll come to that in a minute. But there's a reason we have these two kinds. Now, on its legitimacy, one of the companions of Imam Sadiq asked him concerning the mutah, the temporary marriage. He replied, it's revealed in the Holy Quran, in chapter 4, verse 24. Fari 
of whatever you benefit in marriage with them, with the women, because it's in the context of marriage, the preceding verses. And of whatever you benefit, that's what you benefit from the, in marriage from them, you have to give or give them their compensation, that adds their due compensation as an obligation. Faridatan. When it says Faridatan, this itself indicates the temporary form of marriage. Because in relation to permanent marriages, that dowry isn't vajib. It's not something which has to be given. It's not a prerequisite in relation to the soundness of the permanent marriage contract. In chapter 4, verse 4, Give the women their dowries graciously as a grace. It's a bridal gift. The philosophy there is different to the due compensation which is vajib in temporary marriages. Many Sunni commentators of the Qur'an, such as Fakhri Razi, Zamakhshari, Tabari, although Tabari, it's not certain whether he was Sunni or Shia, in the, both sides of the debate exists. Uh, Nawawi's commentary to Sahih Muslim and many others. When they read this verse as a commentary to the verse, after فَمَسْتَمْ تَعْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ هُنَّ Of whatever you benefit from them in marriage, they add as a commentary to the verse إِلَا أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Until a specified period. That doesn't apply in permanent marriages. It only applies in temporary marriages where not only should the dowry be stipulated as an obligation, but also the timing has to be stipulated. These are prerequisites for the soundness of the contract in temporary marriages. Then it says, فَمَسْتَمْ تَعْتُمْ بِهِ Of whatever you benefit from them, فَآتُوهُنَّ You give. That much you, in proportion to that which you benefit, you give. We'll come to this later, but in temporary marriages, for example, if, if it's a one-week term, and then the woman, for whatever reason, she leaves, halfway through. You give that much that you benefit from. In this case, it will be half a week, so it will be half the stipulated dowry would have to be given as an obligation, not the full dowry anymore. This doesn't apply in permanent marriages with the, with the sadar, with the bridal gift. That's another rational, totally, it's different to this. All these are indicators that this is the temporary marriage that is related, all from this one verse. And even the Sunnis have it. But they believe in it too. But from the second Khalif, he, uh, the Khalifa, he, he abrogated the ruling. When, when, when someone assigns something which Islam and the legislator of Islam didn't assign, me and you, we have to worry. Even today, if it were to happen, someone says something Islam says this is wajib, they assign something which we believe that Islam doesn't, we have to worry, we have to act. And there are other reasons too, such as in chapter 2, 221 says, don't marry the non-Muslim women. And in chapter 5, verse 5, it says, you can marry women of other scriptures. Okay, that seems as a contradiction. But when it says you can marry women of other scriptures, it's referring to the temporary marriage can't be referring to anything else. But you can't marry non-Muslim women the permanent, in permanent marriages. There's only one Majah who's accepted, one living Majah, and one who passed away many years ago in Najah. Although just on the margin, if you're a follower of Ayatollah Sistani, if you're married to a Muslim woman, you can't do a temporary marriage with a non-Muslim, a Christian or a Jew, based on his um, ihtiyat. Okay, so that's one issue that we see in relation to that. Now, this non-permanent, this temporary marriage was brought 
in the best interests of society. It wasn't brought just willy-nilly. It was brought for our best interests, for society to be most moderate in their behaviors. It came to fill in the vacuums that the permanent marriage could not fill in. And one can't escape from this fact that there are these conceivable scenarios whereby it's through the temporary marriages that these scenarios can be answered. And without them, society will not have an answer for them. We see many of these instances. I'll mention a few of them now. One of them, as I said, if you're about to sin, and permanent marriage is not a possibility for whatever reason. It differs from culture to culture. And you're, you're, going, you're on the brink of sinning. True, it's because of your animal dimension predominating over you. But we don't want to judge people there. We just want to see what Islam has put forward here. So you're single and you can't enter a, prime, a permanent marriage for whatever reason. Maybe your parents don't let you or you're scared of something or whatever. And, and you're about to sin. Adultery may be an option for you. Masturbation may be an option for you. Even being with someone, even it's, if, if it's not intimate, but if shahwa, biological excitation arises, it's haram in Islam. You just want to do something to calm yourself down in whatever way. If you don't believe in the temporary marriage, what are you going to do? It will definitely lead to negative consequences in society. Even a simple handshake. You want to be close with a woman, but not intimate. Or as some, a preface to a relationship. See, all these are different scenarios. And if it weren't for this temporary marriage, you don't know what you should do. These are all legitimate scenarios that we're facing. And then, if they find no root, and then they go into these different sins, be it adultery or other things, some people may even go to drugs to even intoxicate themselves from even thinking about, you know, thinking about these issues. These things exist. With masturbation, which is getting quite common, the thing is, we don't believe in it in Islam. I spoke about this a bit before, because we believe it's abusing the soul. It's not a piece of wood outside you that you're playing around with. It's you. The physical body is a subtle manifestation of you, of the I. This is self-abuse. You can't grow spiritually through self-abuse. This is worse than abusing yourself even by, for example, stabbing yourself. This is much worse. This is spiritual abuse. You're abusing the essence of who you are. Now, our children in the West, they go to school here, and actually in the schools they tell them, actually masturbation is good for you. It makes you more calm. And actually, they're right in the schools when they say that. But they're right in this sense that the animal you will calm down. But we're not animals. We're humans. We want that spiritual tranquility. Do we have to go and depress ourselves to the levels of animals and do things on that level? Of course not. We're humans. We want to grow as humans should grow. And we can't do that with this kind of spiritual self-abuse. The next question that arises is that did the infallibles, did the imams, for example, did they enter such relationships? And this is quite a controversial area. Some people believe that they didn't. And even in Wasa'il Shia, the main compendium of Shia traditions, there you only find two traditions. They don't find those two traditions authentic. They don't believe that the Imams, many of them, even one major, I was with them personally, he told me. 
he doesn't accept it, that they entered into temporary marriage arrangements. Some people believe that they did. Now, even if they were to have entered temporary marriage, this point is important, and I did mention this in relation to their permanent marriages, it doesn't matter. With the Prophet and the Imams, their permanent and their temporary marriages, assuming that's substantiated, it's a controversial area, history has to decide, you have to look through the accounts and so on and so forth. But even if they were to have exited them, it wasn't out of their own will. See, their manifestations of Allah's attributes, their behavior, how they speak, how they act, it's all on the par with Allah's will. They don't speak from their own inclinations. They don't do that. It's all on a par with Allah's will. If Allah says, marry this 80-year-old, they marry. There's nothing. It, it becomes a wajib. See, for the Imams, everything becomes wajib. This is the definition of qurb nawafil, um, qurb faraid. I have to explain it. It's a long discussion. But if you understand what qurb faraid means, you'll understand these kind of issues. It's all on a par with Allah's will. It's wajib for them. Things which are mustahab or mubah for us becomes a wajib for them. Then sometimes we see that they did things that was outside the Sharia in relation to us though. Marrying more than four wives, for us, it's haram. It's possible that for them it becomes a wajib. It's on a par with Allah's will. The concept of qurb farah, it has to be understood though. And I don't have time for that here, but inshallah, during the next two weeks, if we have time. So for them, they had to do it. It was a responsibility. So marry a 90-year-old, they would do it. For whatever reason, socio-political reason, for reasons of unity, and so on and so forth. But it wasn't their own inclination. But anyway, this is a point where it differs. Now let's look at some traditions where the Imams, it shows that they're against this practice. See, when things become abused, the Imams raise their voice. Ali ibn Yaqteen, came to the seventh Imam, Imam Qadim alayhi salam, and he was married and came and spoke about what the ruling in relation to him having a temporary marriage is. Suddenly the Imam exclaimed, Ma anta wadaka? What are you? It's nothing to do with you. What, what do you want with temporary marriages? But Allah has made you needless of temporary marriage because you're married. What do you want with it? You're Ali ibn Yahdin, you're one of the strong companions. Your spirituality is high. What, 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 what's the relationship between you and wanting temporary marriages? Because temporary marriages, the whole philosophy is different. It's nothing to do with getting closer to Allah. It, it can be. I don't want to put you off or anything, but as permanent marriages, this is where the animal side predominates. In another tradition, the Imam says, he, in relation to temporary marriages, he halalun, it's halal, mubahun, it's permissible, mutlaqun, absolute. For who? For those who Allah hasn't made needless through marriage, because they haven't married. These people, it's okay, it's halal, it's permissible, absolutely, no problem. Because you're not needless of this action, because you haven't married yet. Then it says, Fal bil mut'ah. Observe your chastity through the mut'ah if you're a single person, if you're not married, man or woman. If you're about to sin, your, marry, your, your absence of marrying is about to lead you to sin, observe chastity through the motto. If you're about to do adultery, observe chastity. If you're about to masturbate, observe chastity through the motto, the temporary marriage. If you're about to go and drown yourself in shahwa, observe chastity, you're single. 
فاین استغنا عنها به تزویج but if you are needless of it because you are married فهي مباه له اذا قاب عنها it would be permissible when you are absent from the wife now it doesn't mean absent for a day or two and we have traditions for example in war that's one of the indications for motel they may not see the wife for a very long time a year, two years, many months there, that's another indication or if you're absent for long periods of time now look at this, just this example of the war and we have many traditions on this where in war it's given the go ahead and look at in America look at the amount of rape that is happening in the army I mean, you should know that it's on the news now it's quite a big issue this not only are they raping women they're even raping homosexually now. Man on man. It's getting out of control. When you prohibit that animal side and it keeps on accumulating, it leads to these side effects. Now, if it happens here, it can happen anywhere. They're not you know, more or less human than us. They also have the same biological instincts as we do. See, that's where it can lead to. دعوها Abandonate This is another tradition of Imams, Imam Qadim alayhi salam Abandon the temporary marriage when someone kept on asking about him اما يستحي أحدكم أن يرى في موضع الأورة فيهمل ذلك على صالح إخوانه وأصحابه Aren't any of you scared to be seen in these suspicious places putting a stain on your righteous brothers and companions? Is it worth it? Come on, get rid of the animal side. Be, be more spiritual. Be in contact with the real you. Don't be drowned in the animal side. Another tradition, stop insisting on the mota. Stop insisting on this temporary marriage. إِنَّمَا عَلَيْكُمْ إِقَامَةُ السُّنَّةِ It's only enjoined to revive the sunnah. See, this is quite an important point. We'll come to it in a minute, later on. It's only there for you to enjoin, to, it's only enjoined so that you revive the sunnah. What does that mean? We'll come to later. فَلَا تَشْتَغِلُوا بِهَا أَنْ فَرْشِكُمْ وَحَرَائِرِكُمْ Stop drowning yourself in it. Stop occupying yourself with it. If you do, فَيَكْفُرْنَ The women will disbelieve. وَيَتَبَرِّينَ The women will distance themselves from religion even. وَيَدْئِينَ عَلَى الْأَمْرِ بِذَلِكْ وَيَلْأَنُونَ They'll even curse us. You see, the Imam saying the women will even curse us if you keep on insisting on this issue. And there are many traditions like this. There's one tradition where Imam Sadiq and Islam mentioned to two people said, look, when you come to here, Medina, there's no mutter for you. Just because you've traveled and you may be here for a long time, I don't want any mutter here. People will see you and they'll say, these are the companions of Imam, of Imam Sadiq. See, these things are important. These things have to be carefully scrutinized. In one tradition, Imam Sadr, alayhi salam, he was speaking about the legitimacy of the mutter. And he was saying it hasn't been abrogated like the second Khalifa had said it was. What he did for himself, he legislated for himself. It's an innovation, a bidder. And then one of the questioners, then when Imam Sadr was saying this, suddenly came the question. He said, يسرك النساءك وبناتك أخواتك أخواتك وبنات أمك يفعلنا Would you be happy if the women of your household if your sisters, if the daughters of your aunts and so on and so if they were to do the motto, would you be pleased? Would you accept that? You're saying this to Imam Saadah and Yisrael فأعرضه Anhu Abu Ja'far Hina Dhakarahu Nisa'ah Wa Banata Ammi Here when Ibn Sadiq he encountered this question he turned away from the person when he 
spoke of the women of your household. He didn't like it. Of course he didn't like it. His daughters then entered temporary marriages. Imam Qadim salam had many daughters. None of them married. Marriage isn't a joke. They don't have those animalistic tendencies to, if they don't marry, they'll fall into sin. And they, would, they want a permanent marriage, a spiritual marriage. If there's someone who can get them closer to Allah, we'll marry. But we don't have a problem. Mutah isn't for us. Why should it be for them? You see? Yes, but if you have been drowned in the animal side, and you're not sinning, is going to lead to that. Especially if you're single. Yes. It's a, it's a leeway for you. It's not a leeway for men to abuse women. It's not a leeway for any kind of oppression to occur. If that happens, that's haram. If people are abusing it, well, anything can be abused. The person who manufactures the knife, he doesn't aim for that knife to be, for example, used to kill someone. It can be abused. But it's nothing to do with Islam. Muslims are behaving badly. Anything can be abused in Islam. But that not, don't criticize Islam, though. Okay, now, so what are the differences between the permanent marriage and the temporary marriage from the Sharia's point of view? In permanent marriages, assuming the dowry is not stipulated in the contract, the contract doesn't become nullified. For example, you forget to stipulate the dowry in the permanent marriage. The, con the contract read is still sound. There's no problem there. But in a temporary marriage, if that's not stipulated, the dowry, it's void. See, these are legitimate differences. In permanent marriages, the man and wife inherit from one another. In temporary marriages, they don't inherit from one another, unless you stipulate it at the time of the contract. In permanent marriages, you can't stipulate a lack of copulation. In temporary marriages, you can stipulate a lack of copulation. You can stipulate anything in temporary marriages. You can even stipulate no handshaking if you want, just speaking together. Because you know, shahwa is haram. If speaking together leads to biological excitation, that's haram. You can use the temporary marriage, but stipulate there should be no touch. There should be no taking of the hijab, just speaking with one another in a closed environment. See? It, it, you can do many things through temporary marriage. Even things like dating can be done in the context of a temporary marriage. There was this kid, brother who actually went and told the father of the American girl, who was a Christian, he said, I don't want any copulation, I just want to be friends with her. But even touching her and sitting alone with her, there are some limitations that the Sharia poses, I, I want your permission. And actually, he was thrilled with that, the father. You see, these things are important. Don't be embarrassed about it. It's better than masturbating. It's better than adultery. It's better than sh haram, shahwa. But if you just do these things, you're going to fall into haram. Now, many of you, your parents, they have from a, come from a different culture. They may give you a hard time. I can't do anything there. But many of you, with younger parents, no, they may be more understanding here. But the next generation, future generations, will be more understanding. The, the problems children are having, the youth are having today, won't be as difficult in the next generation. Nafaqa in permanent marriages is vajib, the maintenance is vajib, but no such duty occurs upon the man in temporary marriages, unless again it's stipulated at the contract. Women. No, sorry. There's no need to stipulate a time frame in permanent marriages, but you have to stipulate a time frame in temporary marriages, and there are one or two other differences. Differences between the temporary marriage and prostitution. That's another question. They say, well, that's just a form of prostitution. What's the difference? No, it's very different. In temporary marriages, first of all, it's a form of marriage where the contract, the dowry, the time frame, all these have to be stipulated. If they're not stipulated, it's not void. In prostitution, no, no such stipulations exist. In temporary marriages, you have to get the consent of the father. You have to 
best, it has to be in the best interest of the father. Uh, the, the father has to act in the best interest of the girl. You have to get permission from the father. And, um, unless the girl, for example, has married before she's not a virgin. And there are other exceptions and one or two differences there. There's no need to get into that. But in prostitution, no such permission is required. I mean, the prostitutes, they don't look for that permission. But they do there. Mm -hmm. The edde, the waiting period, has to be observed after the marriage of temporary marriages. Prostitutes don't have that. This canonical responsibility upon the children, assuming children were to arise in temporary marriages, we don't have that. Such a responsibility in those other instances. So these are legitimate differences. But the point is, it fills the vacuum and areas where t permanent marriages cannot suffice, do not suffice. That's the main reason here. Al-Bikru la tatazawwaju mut'atan illa bi'idhna abiha. The virgin can't undergo mut'a, um, can't undergo temporary marriages unless with the father's permission. That's the overwhelming majority of Fulbaha. They accept this tradition. They base their fatwas on this tradition. Another tradition, La ba'sa ayyata matta al-bikra ma lam yafud ilayha kirahiyyat al-ayb ala ahliha There's no problem with doing a temporary marriage with a virgin, but let there be no copulation there. This is important. But let there be no copulation. Because if copulation arises, if intercourse arises, it may be a fault upon the family of that girl. It's possible. Because there's no guarantee they'll marry. And if it comes out, it's not going to be good. It will cause, you know, families have dignity, your parents have dignity, you can't put their compromise with their dignity. There's no need for temporary marriages to have to involve. It's permissible. But there's no need that it, intercourse copulation has to result. Actually, I, when the youth come to me, I say, try to do it without it. There's no need. You don't need that copulation. When those who are absorbed and drowned in the animal self, they just want some form of remission, a seminal remission. That's it. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be through copulation. You have to be careful in such instances. But the father's permission is necessary. Now there was one instance where the father, one direct, I had this instance which I directly was dealing with, when the father was pleased for the daughter to be in adulterous relationships and to be in relationships of haram. But when the daughter mentioned the idea of the temporary marriage, the father said, no, you can't. That, that, that was incredible. I went to one of the marriages in a home, one of the main marriages, and asked him what the daughter's responsibility is. And the marriage said, no, the father's responsibility is, is, is void. Why? Because the father has to act in the best interest of the girl, the best religious interest of the girl. The father was pleased for them to do any haram action. But when it comes to a halal way, the father, for whatever grudge against religion, says, no, no, that's, that's out of the question. So only if the father's, in, father's looking at the best interest of the girl, otherwise even there, even for permanent marriages, they lose that right of consent. Okay. Now, another philosophy underlying the existence of the temporary marriage, and we see this a lot, is to revive Islam. Because we have these traditions where Imam Sadiq really speaks about, you, know, you have to do it at least once in your lifetime. He keeps on stressing about it. Now, this is... You have to understand what, it, what this is about. For example, in one tradition, لا تخرج من الدنيا حتى تهي السنة Don't leave the world before dying, before, unless you revive this sunnah. فإني verily I أحب أن تهي السنة رسول الله I like to revive the sunnah of the Holy Messenger. And the reason he was saying this because when the second Khalifa made it haram, if Imam Sadiq wouldn't commend 
and encourage people to actively do this temporary marriage, this would have been obliterated in Islam. Today, that risk doesn't exist. We all know it's part of Islam, true Islam. So, that encouraging doesn't apply as it did then. That was a specific purpose, a kind of jihad. So at this end, and they succeeded. Today we have it. Everyone regards it as true. But just think if we didn't have it. Just think if our ancestors of that time, they were indifferent to it. We wouldn't have it today. Or as, it, as we have it today now. And it would have caused a lot of problems without the temporary marriage. Adultery, this, that and the other. Our ancestors did a very important duty for us. Amir al-Mu'mineen salam said, Lola ma naha anha Omar ma zana illa shaqi. If Omar hadn't prohibited that, no one would have committed adultery except the wretched one. These things are important. And today still, we have problems in society, Muslim communities, in relation to this. And that's because men have abused it. And men, women have abused it too. It's not only one side, it's a two-sided thing. Actually, in contracts, wedding contracts, it's the woman who gives the permission to the man. She says the contract, I wed you to myself. The man just accepts. It's a two-way thing. They're both abusing it. But sometimes men, in different ways than women, they abuse, they're abusing this. And the results are this. Pornography is increasing now. They, they don't do the, for example, the temporary marriage. But pornography is increasing. Children are emailing me. But I don't want to scare you. If, if I say 10 or 20 percent, but it's still significant. We have to do something here. When a daughter is emailing saying, my father's seeing pornography. Father, they're going on these sites, they think, they go on the computer, they go on these sites, they don't understand, the children know more about the computer, they go on the computer, they track everything, all the sites the father's gone to. These dating sites, it's increasing. Why? These are major issues, masturbating, it, it, it's getting more and more, male and female. This is one of the sources of it. We have to observe what sex means. Sexuality in Islam is something sacred. It goes deep to your essence in every dimension of you. You're a multi-dimensional being from the animal, the barzakhi, the immaterial, all these dimensions. Sex also has a role in all these dimensions. Don't just limit it to one aspect of it. That's what we're doing with it. It's always a taboo. It's always put under the carpet. We're not allowed to speak about it. Alhamdulillah, this community is more open. You're ready to listen, at least up to now. These are so important. There has to be discussions on it. Okay. Okay. And finally, one last dilemma which arises is this, and it's from the woman's side, that let's say the woman doesn't want to have sex with the husband. For whatever reason, she, either she can't or she's disabled or whatever. There's a way for the man here. That's through temporary marriages. There is, there is a way out though. There's a leeway here for the man. I mean, he can't, he can't divorce the woman just because there's no sex there. That's unethical. That's wrong. He has to continue and provide with the nafare to the woman. Now, the woman can't satiate his needs. There's a way out. There's the motto. If you don't believe in temporary marriage, what's the man going to do now? It has to be something haram. But now the question is this. This is the dilemma. Now let's say the woman is not satiated with the man's performance. This is a problem, it's happening. These things have to be, solutions have to be given. So what if she needs to be satiated, but the man can't 
to give. Two choices exist. Two options exist here. Either she has to be divorced, and then she remarries, she becomes a mother for new children, and in relation to her previous children, she has custody over the girl, assuming they have children, the girl up to seven years, the woman has custody over, and then after seven, it's only one or two years left, then the girl can choose for herself who, who she wants to go to. So seven out of nine years, it's with her mother. The mother's a nurturer. The, the girl has to be under the hands of a nurturer to learn this nurturing thing. With boys, yes, up to two years, it's up to the custody of them. There are one, one, there's one Majin Najaf, one Majin Qom, who says even for men, but for boys, they have custody up to seven years. But anyway, either she has to be divorced, and she, she wants it, she wants to be divorced, and she'll remarry, she'll be a mother to new children, and then have custody, and then she, they can separate, you know, divide the time between the, that previous husband and the woman with their children, and so on and so forth. That's one option. Or there's no divorce, and she has to be patient, and she has to take it, bear this difficulty. So it's one of these two. I can't think of a third route here. Now, which one does Islam want? Does Islam want the woman to be divorced? Or does Islam want the woman just to suffer? Although, if the woman, sometimes the woman can say, no, no, I'm ready to suffer. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be patient. These are women of a certain group, they're a minority. But they can say, no, okay, I don't want a divorce. I'll be patient and my husband doesn't say shit for my needs, but that's okay, I'll be patient for the children's sake. They, a woman may say that. I'm not saying it's the right thing to Women, the spirituality differs. And I don't want to say that. But anyway, they either have to be divorced or they have to suffer. It's one of these two routes. In Islam, now this is my own understanding of Islam here. I don't want to say this is 100%. But these things have to be discussed more. Which of these two roots is Islam maybe pointing the finger to? Maybe it's the first, this divorce thing. And let me just explain why. As I say, unless you know, the, the woman doesn't want it. And that's because Islam has laid a lot of sexual rights for the woman. You know, sexuality isn't just about the bedroom and X minutes of action. It's much deeper than that. And these rights are given to the woman. And it's quite deep. Now, why do I say that? I say that because of the Sharia. The Sharia is a kind of worldly manifestation of the Tariqa. It's one reality, different manifestations. If you want to see what the answers are in the Tariqa, the Sharia, again, is the key. In the Sharia we have it, and all the Fugaha have said this. They've said it's Vajib, by way of precaution, that if a woman's needs aren't satiated, the man has to divorce, or the man has to provide the needs of the woman. It's Vajib to divorce, because you're doing something haram. So that means the man has to go and get counselling. The man has to make an effort. Again, this is different. If a woman says, no, it doesn't matter, I'll be patient. And that's, that's a different scenario. That's just forbearance of a very high degree. I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's not what we're dealing with here. But it's wajib for the man to divorce, or he, it's wajib when to go get counseling. He has to get that counseling. He has to talk. He has to go out. He has to solve this issue. The woman has rights in this realm. Now, if the woman doesn't want to divorce still, okay, that's her choice, it's okay, you live happily ever after. But some women, they can't. And they may sin during the marriage. Islam doesn't accept that. Doesn't accept female masturbation, doesn't accept adultery and many other sins. If you're patient enough, that's another issue. But the woman can't sin here. She can't just be patient and say, oh, I'll just, just continue with sinning, no. So it, you have to get counselling here, it's important.
Now, you may say, but the Sharia is even enhancing this aspect of neglecting the woman's sexual rights. You say, why? You say, because it's only vajib once every four months. See, that hasn't been understood either. When it says it's vajib, copulation is vajib at least once every four months, it's not that we're neglecting the woman here. No. Whatever the woman needs on a par with what women on the, the norm needs, let's say once a week or twice a week. If it's once a week, she has to be provided once a week. That once every four months is just the letter of the law so the woman isn't bothered. So that she can, she's not bothered in any way. Otherwise, if she requires it that once a week, anything which is the norm in one society, she has to be given that. Not that she has to be only given it once every four months. That's been mis misunderstood. See, these are things that are important. Sorry if I went out of my line a bit on these issues. But these have to be discussed. Your children are seeing it. They're seeing the problems. And it'll only get worse.